welcome to Board Game Breakfast. Now you may have noticed that this is late, quite late, and for that I apologize, but that's because I just got back last night from the Essen Spiel Fair. We'll talk about that more in Tom Thinks. But wow, was that exhausting. The most exhausting convention we've ever gone to, I think. Just so much to see and do there. And we got a lot accomplished there. But at the same time, it did wipe us out a bit. So I did want to say thank you to everybody who came by and said hello to us there. And there were plenty of those. But hey, since this is late, we should get right into the things. So here's the news. I'm pretty sure the main news of this week will be the fact that Scythe launched a few hours ago, but that's Kickstarter news, but man, I predict that might even hit a million bucks. Anyhow, Fantasy Flight's announced a new monster slash hero expansion for Descent, because also, in other news, the sun was shining. But this one's called Stewards of the Secrets. Um, I, I do like the, the, the new models of the Blood Apes. Plaid Hat has launched a new website called Play Plaid, which allows you to do different things. Initially, at least you can make decks and things for the new Ashes Rise of the Phoenix Born. The Magic the Gathering board game uh, expansion was announced a bit ago, but now there's more details. In fact, I had a chance to look at it briefly when I was at Essen. There is a gigantic blue creature in there that everyone can be fighting against. Um, for one of the scenarios that comes with this, but then also you can use this and this will finally allow us to deck build and army build like we've been waiting for. I don't think one expansion is enough to do it for this game, but they seem to indicate that there are many, many expansions coming down the road. Modifius has announced two separate games. The first one, they have the license for Kung Fu Panda. Now that's a movie I think almost everybody likes, and this is a cooperative style game in which you're taking the form of the panda or mantis or with the different groups there to fight against evil bad guys. Sounds fun. They're also announced, and this is a surprise to me, a reprint of Mutant Chronicles Siege of the Citadel. Now, I, I, they have some big-name designers coming in to help on this, including um, Kevin Wilson and Eric Lang and Richard Borg. And this is a game that Richard Borg did a while ago. Kind of think of almost a cooperative or against each other fighting miniatures through almost like Warhammer 40, 40K, but condensed slightly. It's hard to explain, but it was pretty simple. I'm curious to see where they'll take this in the future. So I've been talking about Star Trek Attack Wing and X-Wing miniatures, and I forwarded the thesis that X-Wing does a better job capturing the feel of its IP than Attack Wing does for its. Today we're going to do an even deeper dive on the subject. The thing I struggle with is the fact that Star Trek should really be able to come up with a better game. Whereas Star Trek has more than 700 hours worth of material to draw from, Star Wars only has six canonical movies. And Fantasy Flight has made a conscious decision to disregard half of those because the brand of the prequels is so bad and they're probably worried that people won't buy them. So they need to rely on the expanded universe more, which is really a weakness. I mean, for as much as I love Sunterfell and Tycho Chelhu on the when I'm playing them, I don't really care about Sunterfell or Tycho Chelhu. I don't even know if I'm saying their names right. And while the focus in a Star Wars game should be on assembling your little squad you're going to battle with, the feel of a Star Trek game should be assembling your crew. It feels stupid to field a ship with just a captain. As one wise commander said, But my crew, I'm not a commander, huh? I want to be able to mix and match my crew from all the different incarnations of the series. I want to be able to put Captain Kirk on the Defiant with Tom Paris, Worf, Odo, Dr. Phlox, and Shirtless Sulu. Or a ship of only Spocks, including movie era Spock, reboot Spock, mirror universe Spock, Ambassador Spock, and giant Spock from the animated series. Or to run a ridiculous point into the ground, what I really want is Captain Proton, Mortal Q, Friar Tuck Data, and Deanna Troy as a cake. Now you could argue that Star Trek Fleet Captains already scratches this itch. And to a degree it does, but it's a 4X game, not a space combat simulator. So it's not exactly what we're looking for. There's obviously demand for a combat game that's more engaging. Engage. All I can hope is that Star Wars Armada in the long run proves successful enough that whiz kids will copy it too. Or that Fantasy Flight will just somehow get the rights to do Star Trek games. Hey folks, for day 
with our productions this week, I do want to make mention about the fact that we were in Essen, and so there is kind of a, going to be a kind of a small lull. Now, we will have reviews coming out this week. It's just the fact that I don't know exactly what. We got over 200 games at Essen, and combined with the over 60 that we already have, there's just a plethora of games for us to go through and play and review. We will actually get some of those done and out this week. I'm hesitant to say which names we will show you because, you know, things might change. But starting with next week, hopefully I'll be able to give you more specifics as to which games will be coming. The Dice Tower itself, audio podcast, is a live show that we recorded at Essen. I don't have video of that show, but it will be put up an audio version, and that should be put up shortly uh, after Board Game Breakfast today. And, um, of course, there's all kinds of other stuff coming from everybody else. Our top 100s may be finished, but we have more top 10s coming for you. Board Game Blender's coming out this week. There's a whole great number of shows to see on the Dice Tower Network. So go check all that out at Dicetower.com. I'm Tom Vassell. Jason Levine. And today our question is a question about games with longevity. The person said that they like Terra Mystica and played Terra Mystica six times in a row. And then they want they feel like they could do that again. Are there other games that are so good that you can keep playing them in a row like that and multiple times still finding new strategies each time? I think most games are like that. I, think. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of games I like. But I don't want to play them, after I play them, I don't want to play them the next game again, per I se. I do. There's a lot of times where I'll play a game and then I'll be like, let's play it again right now. All right, well, why don't and you pick some of the best ones for replayability sake? The best ones? Well, I, you know, obviously... Point to your top ten, I know. Yeah, I could point to my top ten, and those ones I've But some of those games are out of print, of so games. think of a game that's in print that would reward a lot of... Replayability? Yeah. Well, obviously the mainstay games, King of Tokyo, gets played a lot. Whether there's more strategic things that you learn as you go, not really. Yeah, I don't know that to help him. He likes Terra Mystica, though. He's looking for deeper games. If we're looking for deeper games, a lot. personally, I think the ones that you learn a lot are war games and things like that. Because if they're card-driven games and the cards come out, the cards are going to come out in a different order. Or a game like War of the Ring, where each time you play it, the cards are going to come out slightly different. You're going to learn more about what the techniques are for each side. I would pick uh, on the, the Euro game side, if you're looking for games with that sort of thing. So, uh, I'm not a huge fan of splatter games, but they offer a lot of depth and replayability. Yes. Um, Orleans is a recent game which has a good amount of depth, at least I think so. And um, if you're looking a little bit, maybe on the lighter side, Orleans or um, uh, Elysium have some, some depth to them. Um, I think Caverna offers a lot of depth. I, I've played it many, many times, and I still am always anxious to play it some more. So those would be some picks that I would recommend. Maybe someday we'll do a top 10 list on the subject. Elysium, I think I would add to, especially because you only play with five of the gods each time, so each game you're making it slightly different. And if you can find Puerto Rico, definitely. Oh yeah, I'm not sure if that's in print or not at this point in time. But if you have questions, folks, send them to us at dicetower at gmail.com. Until next week, I'm Tom Vassell. Jason Levine. Marler from Pair of Dice, Paradise here, continuing to explore the fantastical and vivid world of board game component storage. Oh, can you stand it? Last episode, I showed my copy of Eldritch Horror, with all its components encased lovingly in plastic bags. Yes, nearly all of its components were bagged, including the decks of cards. <laughs> what? Cards and bags? Can you stand it? Well, after that episode aired, zero or more viewers asked for my opinion on several other methods of storing cards. And so, always wanted to do my part for the board game hobby, whether anyone asks me to or not, I have compiled a list of my top six card storage techniques, ordered here for you from the simplest to the most sophisticated. Here we go. Number six, baggies. Baggies. They're the card storage equivalent of sweatpants. They're simple, they're roomy, and some of them in my collection have waffle syrup stains on them. 
but you know, they're still my card storage method of choice, because they're so easy to use with a variety of different card sizes, and I am so very, very lazy. Number five, rubber bands. Rubber bands are simple, versatile, and compact. But you know, when I use these, I'm always worried that the cards are gonna slide out through the side that's not rubber banded. Like that. So when I rubber band my cards, I twist the rubber band to cover all four edges. It's an approach that can sometimes lead to damaging some of the outer cards in the pile. Oh. If only there was a solution that was similar to rubber bands, but gentler on our cards. If there was, I'd put it on this list. Number four, ouchless hair bands. Ouchless hair bands offer the elastic containment of rubber bands without being as potentially harsh on cards as rubber bands are. Ouchless hair bands are typically thicker than rubber bands, which can help them keep a better grip on a stack of cards. However, they don't seem to stretch as large, which can prevent them from working as well with a really large stack of cards. So, it's kind of a give and a take. And there's the first three mind-blowing ideas in board game card storage. Next time, we'll conclude this list with the three remaining card storage solutions. Until then, just place your cards carefully on a stool next to your board game collection. Don't worry, they should be absolutely safe there until next week. Thanks! Hey now, my name is Nick from Board Game Brawl, and over on my channel I reviewed only five games this past week, but boy were some of them a doozy. Let's start off with the worst, which is Heroes from Rebel Games and Lion Games. Interesting premise, you are magic-style summoners fighting each other back and forth with monsters and slinging spells with real-time dice rolling to fuel them it just didn't work for me totally random very unbalanced for the love of god do not play it with three or four players like the box says it's only a two-player game but a pass for me either way then we move on to Risk Marvel Cinematic Universe, which is actually two games in one. The Risk part of the equation is actually not too bad. It's all the different Marvel heroes and villains going against each other with special objectives. Definitely a lot faster than normal Risk and pretty interesting with some cool bits. But the other part of the game is Guardians of the Galaxy Dice Game, which is actually Risk Express and Age of War from Reiner Knizia, rethemed with special powers. Still very boring though and totally a pass, but as a whole package, it's okay. Then we move on to Time Stories, which is a super hot game right now. Fully cooperative time travel game. It's actually more of a storytelling game. I can't say too much more about it without giving spoilers. I liked it a lot. Super thematic, beautiful graphics and presentation. The replayability is what keeps this from being an even higher score for me. I am worried about that. Definitely needs expansions, but still an incredible experience. Then we move on to Pandemic Legacy, another super hot game. This one I really enjoyed because Pandemic, while a good game for me, I was totally burned down on it. Don't even have it in my collection anymore. But with this, it definitely brings new life to it, even if it does have a limited replay value. I love the Legacy aspect. Can't wait to play it more and more and more and more and more. And then we go on to the Big Beast, which hopefully will be up by the time you see this video. And that is my review of Kingdom Death Monster. I had tons of anticipation for this game. It could have been a total train wreck. I was expecting it to be, but I love it. It is so wonderful. It is an experience like no other. It's fiddly as all get out. It's super expensive. I can't recommend it for everyone. But if you do ever have a chance to give it a shot, it's an incredible, mind-blowing, cooperative, thematic experience. Love it. That's all for this week. Thank you so much. Take care. Hello, my friends. It's the Game Boy Geek here. Last week, I reviewed Kabuki, which is a children's family-style memory game. Uh, in the end, it was just too random and not very fun at all. Nyet was a trick-taking card game, which adds a really interesting aspect to bidding or betting on what's Trump and Super Trump, has some awesome artwork, uh, but in the end I had trouble with how long the game was, and also if you play shorter rounds, it, the scoring gets kind of wonky. Retro Lunacy is a new printing with Atari and skateboards and a VW bus and muted colors to go back in time for a, a, a fast speed game that I have enjoyed, and that's a new version of Lunacy, Retro Lunacy. The Grizzled is a cooperative game in World War I. It's a card game. It is a very solid game, probably overhyped, 
but at the same time, it warrants a lot of people talking about it. So that's the Grizzly in a solid game there. And the last one is Cartagena. I learned about this from Eric Summers' Top 100 list. If you took Candyland and Shoots and Ladders and made it an actual game that gamers love, but you can also have non-gamers playing like, amazing gateway game, Cartagena. Hello, Dice Tower. Two reviews this week. The first one was The Builder's Antiquity, a follow-up to The Builder's Middle Ages. Very much an improvement on the original game. Got some extra little mechanics and stuff that you can do in the game to make it a little bit more interesting and definitely a step up. Uh, this last one was Steamworks from Taste of Municipal Games. Very unique sort of worker placement slash tile placement game where you're building devices through adjacent tiles and you can place your mechanics or your workers on your own stuff or other people's devices and then you just try to generate uh, victory points that way. A very unique take on a worker placement. Thanks. For my reviews this week, I reviewed PBL Robots, which is a game about making robots and fighting each other and have different arms and legs and sounds cool, but unfortunately had zero development done to it. Me Want Cookies. This is a fun little game for kids as you follow different uh, connections between cookies or other desserts. Tick Talk is a game in which you roll dice, use the letters on those dice to make words. The other team then has to guess what those words are. They have the same amount of time as you had making the words. Interesting game. Graveyards, Ghosts, and Haunted Houses. This is a tile land game where you're trying to form big groups. It's a nice improvement on the first game in this series and has some fun artwork. Duplik, which is a reprint of Portrayal. This was actually nominated for the Spiel des Jahres in Germany, where there's a crazy picture and one person describes it to everybody else. They draw it, and then you check to see if you've met certain criteria. Jolly Roger. Now, this game works best with a big group of people as you're all going together to search for treasure, but the captain and the, usually gets the best share of the treasure, but every once in a while someone will get annoyed and have a mutiny against the captain. Loads of theme. Silly fun. Cave Troll is the reprint of the Fantasy Flight. This is, I think, the fourth version of the game. Solid area control with card play type game. Not a dungeon crawl like it looks, but still a great game. Chronicler is a small card civilization game, uh, which uh, allows you basically to play cards in a manner to build monuments. It's not much a civilization, but a great card game. Shakespeare. Oh, this game is brimming with theme, worker placement, action selection. Really enjoyed this one. In fact, I cleared a whole shelf off my, out of my collection. I took the 10 day series. Um, out and I kept just one of them and so now I have lots of space for well like four or five games So Shakespeare was added to my collection as Oz was also matcha Which is a two-player game which I found fascinating There's only a few cards in the game But trying to figure out when your opponent's gonna play something kind of a rock paper scissors element But at the same time looking and seeing what cards were everywhere very cool and Port, Port Royale, which is not actually a new game. It's been out a couple years, but this push your luck pirate themed game. Really love this one. I like playing with a full complement of players. They just released an expansion, which I haven't seen yet. But I mean, even without the expansion, a lot of fun. Hey, welcome to the 101. Today we're painting the Bosons from Rum and Bones. Let's get to the table and see how it turns out. First step is to paint a Kador blue on the back and then in the front a Yusabi bone. Paint the sash Mephiston red and then a Beastle or XV88 for the boots. Next we paint the anchor lead belcher or gunmetal and the pants jean steel or purple. Or Next step is to apply an Agrath Urshade shade into it, a wash and you can see you get into detail in the bones. And after adding a wash and dry brushing, you can see we have our boson completed. Okay, for the well poured boson, paint uh, flesh, which is Kesla flesh, and Mechanicus Gray for his pants. After the pants, we paint the leggings and the armband. Next, a Caldor Sky or a True Blue for the sash. Next, the belt and all the chain. Then apply washes. I grab earth shade for the skin, everything else with new oil. Highlight and wash, and there you go. Bosun. Along with the other one, both bosons are finished. Well, that's it. Both bosons are painted. 
and next week we're going to be working on the crew. For an extensive look to see how to do it step by step, go to my channel, Robert Orn, and look for the extended version of this video. Also, on this channel, Battle and Brushes with Sam and I working on Imperial Salt. Till next time on the 101, I'm Rob Orn, and thanks so much. You know what really grinds my gears, and that is when the rules are actually not even included. Like maybe they'll put some small rules in the game and then they'll say, to find the full rules, go here. Or sometimes there's not even the rules. They're just like, here's the game. Oh, if you want to know how to play it, go online. Now that's great that rules are online and I'm glad for that, but put them in the game. I don't always have internet access. Hey everybody, Steve here and here's your AFR two minute drill. The big story we're following this week is over at Play.com where Keith Avalone has relaunched his website. It is now mobile friendly, has much easier navigation. Each game has its own page including free stuff and the shopping cart where you can see exactly what's available for each individual game. And on top of all that they've also announced a brand new release that'll be coming out in 2016, entitled History Maker Golf. No details on that, but we're certainly excited to see another new release from Keith Avalon. In other sports board game news, over on Kickstarter, Joe Bryan from Sideline Strategy Games has launched another campaign for his payoff pitch baseball game, this time to fund the 1933 season. Now the campaign has already reached its goal and it's already unlocked its stretch goal of a Hall of Fame set that includes over 200 of the all-time greatest players. In other Kickstarter updates over at Dice Hate Me Games, they've announced that the bottom of the ninth game should be shipping out to backers later in October. And finally, Roy Spenuelos from Roar Art Games has announced that his pigskin football card game has already gone out to the printers and backers may get it a full month earlier than anticipated, so it may be playing that by Thanksgiving. All right, that's all for now. For more in-depth coverage of all things sports board game related, be sure to head on over to the After Further Review channel. Until then, my name's Steve, and I'll see you next time After Further Review. As you gathered, we went to the Spiel Convention, which is held in the city of Essen, at a large place called the Messe, um, in Germany, and it's held each year, and there's a lot going on there. Just got the statistics from them, and they've announced that there was 910 different exhibitors there from 41 countries. Certainly believable. There was uh, four large halls, Hall 1, 2, and 3, and then Hall 7. They actually had another Hall 4, um, which they were using for this gigantic uh, world record-breaking Catan game, at least until Gen Con, when they break it again, whatever. Um, but that was only used actually one of the days, just a big giant hall there. And there's a few other smattering of rooms throughout the thing, but mostly uh, it's a fair where you go and you look at all the new games coming out and you buy them. Now, they said there was 1,000 new games there. I'm not convinced that that number is completely accurate. I would imagine that they go to each publisher and say how many games you have, and that publisher says, well, this one's been new since last Essen, and this one's been new since, uh, this is a new edition for us. So I would imagine that the number is close to 500 or so, or maybe even lower than that, maybe 400, but that's still a mind-blowing number of games, right? There's just so many games that are out there, and we went through the halls again and again. I mean, we were really there for six straight days going through those halls, and we're not sure that we saw everything. Now, this is a very interesting fair. It's unlike many of the fairs in America when it, it opens at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, although actually they opened it early, which is something that boggles my mind. They said the crowds were so big, they opened it 10, 20 minutes early each day, and we could tell. So if you ever exhibit there, make sure you know that because people are coming in early. Um, but uh, they open the halls at 10 and they close at 7. And once they close at 7, it's done. There's nothing else going on. There's no playing areas. People will go back and play games at their hotels, the various hotels that are scattered around the fair. But usually after eating dinner and such, there's just not a lot of time to play games around the place. But it does happen. But Essen's more about shopping. 
there are secondhand dealers who have tons of old games and there's I probably there's probably eight or nine of those I saw or even new games people selling those but the biggest thing is all the publishers and so many hot games were debuted there the number one question everyone asked us when they came by our booth was, what's the hot game of the fair? Well, we really have no idea about that. We won't know until we've played them all. I can tell you just from talking to people that very hot games, obviously Pandemic Legacy, many people were getting that, and 504, a lot of people were, were wanting to get that one. There was a lot of smaller games that were getting buzzed. Simmerg from NSKN was getting buzzed, but lots of people had all different things, and there was lots of games in there, that, you know, as I'm looking at this pile of games that you cannot see right next to me, like here's a game, Tevron, did you hear about it? It looks good. Here's Bang the Duel. Here's Target. Here's the new version. I mean, here's Epic, which was new, and then the new version of Star Realms, Colony Wars. And there's just so many games that were there. And so it's really going to be hard to pin that down. But I will say, game-wise, seemed to be one of the best Essens I've ever seen with just so many top-notch um, games released. I saw the. I watched for a while the the World uh, Championship of Pandemic, which is a great idea where they have people split in tombs, uh, groups of two. They all play the same game of Pandemic with the exact same thing, exact same epidemics, exact same uh, deck of cards, uh, the same roles. The only difference are the choices they made, and I was fascinated by it because each board I looked at, I would go by and look at all the boards. They have like dividers, so they can't see each other's boards. But they each have their own board, and every board was completely different. Very neat concept. And whoever does the best or survives the longest is the winner of the game. So I like that. Uh, that was neat. And there was other events there. But again, like I said, mostly about buying games. For us from the Dice Tower, hey, for all those of you who came by, a huge thanks. I know on the last day, we may have looked like we were dragging. And that's because we were. But we were just, we were blown away. First of all, on Thursday by the massive line at our booth and the fact we felt bad for the rest of Thursday turning people away because we had run out of tickets for our show and we will work at getting a bigger show next year on that. And again, thank you to Yellow for helping us do that. Uh, but we were just blown away. But even when that line went away, just the number of people who came by and said hello and hi. Some people donated to the tower and got promos. Other people came by bearing gifts. We got hats and cookies and uh, reindeer sausage and candy and and books. It was unbelievable. I have to say the number one country in this regard was the Netherlands. We did not realize what a contingent of listeners we had from the Netherlands. Also, how many listeners we had in Germany and Holland and Israel and wow, the list and Belgium. We got gifts from so many people. We were not expecting that. And we had to like kind of scramble around and say, okay, where are we going to put all this stuff to take home? But it, please believe me, it was certainly appreciated. We really felt a lot of love towards the Dice Tower in Essen, and that was that was just really fun for, for me and Z and, and Jason and Eric while we were there. And so, yeah, we'll be there next year, okay? We'll see you guys then. And we want to say thank you all for coming by. And if you live in Europe or for some reason you have a chance to go to Essen for inexpensive, I highly recommend it, but you will be overwhelmed. It is unbelievable how much is there, but it's fun. <laughs> Hello and welcome, here's Niels again from Cyril's Brettspiele and today we are talking again about the best and the worst mechanism in Codenames from Czech Games Edition and yeah, I'm telling you my best and worst mechanism for Codenames. My favorite mechanism in Codenames is very easy and very simple. Let's say you just finish this round and blue team is winning. Then you can bring in new people, some people can leave. There's no... that's not a big deal if one team has more player than the other team. It's just a hop on, hop off system. After one round, after 15 minutes, you can easily leave or bring in new people. However, the flip side, the worst mechanism in that game is like in a lot of social games. If people who are friends playing in the same team, it's usually that they are using a secret speech, a secret language. So when I would say magic is relating to deck for cards and play for playing magic, they could also uh, using slug for slug fest. Uh, some creatures or whatever or when someone uses a dinosaur in that game always 
or a Please model. send so, me a message, an email, a comment and let me know your personal best and worst mechanism for code names and become part of this show. So Again. these are my favorite and worst mechanism for code names. That was again uh, presented by Sören's Brettspiele. My name is Niels. See you next time. Bye bye. A line of books, a series of video games, and now a board game. The Witcher Adventure board game, designed by one of my favorite designers, released in 2014, and it was quickly followed by an app version for both iOS and Android. How does the game fare in the digital world? Let's take a quick look. In The Witcher, you can play as one of four characters competing to complete quests to gather victory points. You do this by traveling around the board, collecting clues, and fighting off baddies through the dice battles. The end game is triggered when someone completes the required number of quests and the person with the most points wins. I'm told the game is like a cross between Talisman and Elder Sign, but I haven't played Talisman, so I can't attest to that. The Witcher Adventure game is a slick production with great graphics that's available on iOS and Android. There are tons of on-screen hints and guidance text so that you always know what to do next, which is good because as repetitive as the turns are, they never quite felt organic to me. There is a rules section that is chaptered well and serves as a good reference book, but not as a great gameplay teacher. And unfortunately, Witcher uses one of my most disliked tutorial formats, the video. They're chaptered and embedded so you can access them offline, but I found that these were only okay at teaching you the game. There is online play, but it's not cross-platform, and you can choose how many quests to end the game with, which helps you control game length. I also found the game to be really visually dark, which made the blue, red, and purple clue markers kind of hard to see. It's thematic, but I prefer usability when it comes to apps. Overall, this feels like a game that will satisfy Witcher video game fans because of all the story elements that are worked into it, but the AI isn't challenging or variable, the unique character elements don't really feel like they differentiate themselves, and turns feel very samey, and since I'm not a Witcher RPG fan, there just wasn't enough here to resonate. While the Witcher Adventure game app isn't for me, hopefully this segment shows you enough of the game for you to determine if it's something you want to try. Today we're taking a look at the Stonemeyer Games Energy Box. This is one of their three treasure chests that they came out with. And this is not a game, but pieces that can be used to enhance a game. You'll see in here there's a pile of things. These come in bags, but I took them out of the bag and put them in here and I'll eventually be putting them into boxes. But we have here oil, we have trash, we have gas, we have uranium, we have fire, and we have coal. Now these can be used for a variety of games. Probably for me, the number one game that I would use these for would be Power Grid. So you can see here that when you're putting the different resources on the board, this is the original Power Grid. I can put the trash cans here, the oil barrels here, and they fit nicely on the spaces. And the coal can go here. And it is pretty easy to differentiate between different types. Here's the uranium. Gas is used in new power grid and fire can be used in other games. Now, what do I think about these pieces? Well, I'm always a fan of upgrading pieces. I'm always a fan of finding new things. And I like these. Uh, the coal, I probably like the best. It's really nice. The fire is also pretty good. The barrels and the trash cans. I like them and I'm going to use them, but I do have some small criticisms. The paint on the trash cans, well, you just can tell it's been painted. And the oil cans are not, I don't know, they're good, but both of these look like they were done by someone who made them for me. Like if someone, I had a friend who said, hey, I could make these. Same thing with these uranium things. These look good and they're fine, but they have a homemade look about them. And homemade isn't bad, and you know, again, I can add it to my game, but I, I don't know what I was expecting, maybe a little bit more from these. That being said, I don't really think, that that's me being super minor picky about these. I'm definitely gonna be replacing all the pieces in my games with some of these, and I'm gonna show you another one of these treasure chests next week. Hey, Internet. Anyone who plays games with me knows that I love games that let you lie to and bluff your friends. Coup, Cockroach Poker, Skull, Battlestar Galactica, bang, I love these games. So, when I first started hearing about a game that had merchants trying to sneak contraband past the eyes of a corrupt overseer, I said, yes, please! What would Steve buy this time? Arcane Wonders has done a nice job with the production of the game. The art is great, the components are nice, high quality. 
with the exception of the bags, which vary widely from game to game as to whether or not they're actually gonna last you. But overall, looks great. The gameplay is all about lying, bluffing, bribery, and negotiation. Like any good bluffing game, unpredictability is the key. You can play completely honest, you can play the game lying your face off, but the best thing to do is establish a reputation for one, and just when they think they know what you're gonna do, you do something else. Sheriff of Nottingham isn't the game for everyone. There's little room for long-term strategic planning. It's, it's very tactical. And, you know, not everybody likes lying as much as I do. I don't know why. But uh, if you like bluffing games, and you like to lie to your friends right to their face, then Sheriff of Nottingham is the game for you. And Sheriff of Nottingham is what I bought this time. What was your last purchase? And was it a good one? You can leave a comment here on the video, or you can tweet us at Snakes and Lattes. Let us know what you bought last. And that's it for this time, folks. It is now time for me to get cracking on Dice Tower, and then to get cracking on, well, sorting everything out. And there's so many things to, to get jumping on, but we will be doing that. From now till the end of the year, Dice Tower is going to turn into Review Central. You won't see as many top 10s and top 100 stuff from us, but instead you're just going to see reviews, 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 and reviews of games. I hope that you do enjoy that. I hope to see you guys next week. Come back on Thursday, watch Board Game Blender. It's essentially the same thing as this show, but with Z Garcia's spin on things. So go check that out. Until then, I'll see you, and I'm Tom Vassell. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at coolstuffinc.com.